water free where thirsty spirits can be satisfied well drinking at the springs of living water oh happy now my soul is satisfied we're drinking at the springs of living water oh wonderful and bountiful tell you what, nothing like some of them old hymns to get you going. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, this morning, I'm so glad to be standing here this morning because you know what? He is our living hope. Amen? I like the words of this song, how great the chasm, how great that lay between us. No matter how high that mountain is, we got to climb. That he's there right next to us. He's our living hope. He's my source. He's my strength. Amen. So right now, church, I just encourage you, let's block out what time it is, who's standing next to you, who's beside you, who's in front of you. Let's just focus on Jesus and that he is our living hope. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven. Come on, help me. Oh, God. Hallelujah.
an awesome God. We praise you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit, manifest yourself in this place this morning. Praise you, God.
talk to him. He's here to meet your need. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God. Hallelujah. Hung on the cross. cross.
exalt thee, Lord, this morning. We lift you up to the highest of heights that all men might see you and be drawn near to you this morning. God, we thank you, Lord, for every person represented in this house, Lord, and the desire to know you in a greater way, to draw near to you, God, for to be good soil for your word here in just a few moments. We pray, Lord, that, Lord, you will be all things to all people, every need met, Lord, by your presence here today. And God, we give you the praise in advance for what you're going to accomplish in this moment that we have together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Will you give him another clap of praise? And then I want you to do what you do so well here at PCA. I want you to find at least two or three people you don't know their first name. Introduce yourself and find out who they are. Move from the back, move to the front, move to the left and right. As you retake your seats, I like it. I like it. All right, you all have just gotten out of hand is what you all have done. You all just gotten out of hand in this house. We want to take a moment this morning to highlight our giving moment. As we always say, you have lots of opportunities to give here at PCA. Of course, you have your, your avenues online with tithe.ly and those things. Of course, you have those envelopes in front of you. you use cash and checks and those things. You have um, Zelle online as well through your bank. <laughs> you can utilize that. But... This is the opportunity for you to give unto God. If you're a guest, relax. Relax. You don't have to grab a hold of your purse or your pocketbook or anything like that. We don't want anything from you. We want, we've got something for you. And I want you to just relax. But for those that this is your church home, we want you to give unto God your tithe. And then today is also Missions Sunday. And that means that above your tithe, we hope that you'll give something for missions. If you already 
our giving toward missions, don't forget that. It makes a difference. We have a lot of missionaries that depend on us. And once a month, we get to focus on that and to give to make sure that their needs are met, not just monthly, but also when they have a need that we can be able to step up to the plate and fill that need. And it's your faithfulness that makes that happen. So we're going to say a prayer this morning and ask God to bless it as you prepare to give it. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time of giving. We thank you, Lord, that um, the people, Lord, in this church, they know what it means to give. Their tithe, their offerings above that. We thank you for missions, Lord, for the needs that are met there. And we thank you, Lord, for the needs that are met in, in the kingdom and right here at PCA. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. They're coming to receive that. And again, we welcome all of our guests this morning. Great to have you with us. Um, we remind you that right after the service over at Denny's in, on Scottsdale Road, um, the seniors are celebrating the birthdays. Everyone is invited for that. Uh, of course, you've got to pay for your meal and all that, but if you want to come and and uh, and celebrate birthdays you can do that over at Denny's on Scottsdale we also encourage you to jo join us on Wednesday for building university we're in a brand new series there called upside down upside down you can get a hold of that or watch it online and so we hope you'll do that we also remind you that coming up in just a couple of weeks we have our annual business meeting on a Wednesday uh, the 15th Wednesday the 15th so a little time there but if this is your church home you're a member here, you come and join us. If you're not a member and you want to come, you're more than welcome to do so. To hear about what God did in 22 and what he's going to do in 23, we hope you'll join us for that. I hope you've got your outlines ready to go. There's lots of th other things in that bulletin. You can avail yourself of that. Um, get your outlines. We, are, we do outlines here at PCA. If you haven't all figured that out, we believe that which you write and that which you read, you're going to retain. And this morning... Uh, I am so excited to, again, have our guests with us, our online campus with us, lots of people watching from all over the country. Will you welcome both our guests and our online campus with a hand clap? <laughs> this month, we're going to take you on an adventure of what I believe to be one of the foundational ideas to a life that is happy, fulfilling, successful, and complete. That one idea, that one concept that is simple and clear, life-changing and life-giving, that idea is love. This is Love Month. And we thought of a real fun way to get after that and that's by taking some songs, old and new, some love songs, and use them as jumping off points to look at what we believe to be the greatest commodity in the known world, love. So this month, when we look at some really cool love songs, it's our hope that you'll not only be challenged and inspired to give and receive love in fresh ways, but most of all, that you'll be encouraged if you feel discouraged or you feel down, maybe worried and anxious or stressed. I really believe that this is going, uh, that, that you're going to leave here this month full of God's love for you. Leave with a sense that God's going to turn your situation around and your circumstance around because God is faithful. Maybe you tuned in and you're weighed down by some situation in your life, maybe a sickness, maybe a financial crisis. I believe in a God who can save, deliver, provide. He's faithful and God is going to help you right here, right now. Let's take a moment and pray for our message this morning. Jesus, we love you so much because you first loved us. And in these brief moments together, as we approach your book, we don't just want information. We want more of you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. Thank you for your touching and encouraging and uplifting. 
We thank you, Lord, for your healing in people's lives today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. To kick off the Love Songs series this morning, we want to take a look at this song. Can we play that clip? Do we have a clip? Well, it's supposed to be a clip. You're supposed to be able to see it, but that's okay. I can hear it. It's fine. Hearing it is fine. Uh, d- just hear it. Yeah. I see lots of people moving their lips. That was the Beatles. In the 1960s, there was a British program, Our World, and because of satellite technology and its development, they wanted to take it global. And it was really one of the first times anything like that has ever taken place. It was about the mid to late 60s that the Beatles phenomenon was literally taking over the world. So the folks that pulled together the British program, Our World, went to the Beatles and they said, we want you to write a song that will speak to the nations. We want you to write a song that will span culture and ages and nationalities. And so Paul, John, Ringo, and the gang got together and they wrote the words, All You Need Is Love. It was performed for 26 countries. Some say that nearly 400 million people heard the words to that powerful song on that day. And it's the words to this song that have a powerful message. Even the title itself makes a very significant statement. All you need is love. It's loaded with assumptions. Assumptions like love is our greatest need of all of our needs and desires that you and I possess. At its core, our need for love is the most significant. Uh, Assumptions like love was created to be given and received, that we cannot control a great deal of things that happen in our lives, but we can control our willingness to give and receive love. So for the last couple of weeks, I've really been wrestling with this. And that is, is this really a true statement? Did the Beatles get it right? When John Lennon sat down to pen those words to this song, did he really get it right? Is it really true? All you and I need is love. Well, today, let me challenge you to wrestle with some significant questions. Questions like, what, melt, what melts hate? What will take an unhappy and unfulfilling relationship and turn it upside down? What empowers a child to grow and to learn and to become all that they were created to be? What makes a friendship meaningful and lasting? What enables a workplace, a place where you and I spend 40 plus hours a week? What makes it an enjoyable place to go and invest a part of our lives? I firmly believe each of these questions have one definitive answer. It's clear and, 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 and obvious, even in today's context. The one thing that answers all of these questions is the reality of love. All you, all I, all we need is love. You peer into our world and you look at all the challenges and some of the opportunities and some of the brokenness. And when you wrestle with what is the greatest need of any culture, any nation, it's love. Period. And so this morning I want you to walk away with one clear phrase. It's 
certainly the big idea of what I want to push across the table today, but I want it pushed across the table where there are open hands and open hearts that say, you're right. If I give into my world and my relationships and my workplace and my neighborhood with that one statement, I would be armed with the capacity to infect and impact change. Here's the big idea. Love is the only strategy. Love is the only strategy. When hate shows up in our world, our culture, and in our culture, what melts it? Love. When you have a child who isn't learning, growing, when love shows up, something gets altered. When you have a workplace that isn't fun to go to and there's backbiting and issues and challenges, when love shows up, that workplace changes. Love is the only strategy. Multiple studies have been done, especially with children, and what they've discovered is that when love is removed from their life at a significant level, it has more impact on them than any disease that they can contract. One psychologist followed two groups of 12 orphans. The first stayed in the orphanage and got little love and personal attention. The second group were taken to a nearby institution where they were loved directly and affectionately and with great intentionality. And you can imagine what happened at the end of these studies. You had 12 who had not been loved, cared for, and most of them had contracted diseases and learning issues. And many of them had found their way to the end of their life. But these 12 that had been intentionally loved and invested in had gone on to finish high school and, and started college and made a difference in the workplace in multiple ways. Love is the only strategy. One of my favorite stories of all time about the impact that love can have is the story of a boy named Teddy Stoddard. As Mrs. Thompson stood in front of her fifth grade class, she told her students what she told them every year, I love you and I will love you all the same. As school progressed, she realized that she had not always said that from a truthful place in her heart. There was always a student or two that didn't get her full attention, and it kind of bothered her. And there sat a young man who became the object of all of that. His name was Teddy Stoddard. And Mrs. Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play like all the other kids. And she was kind of disappointed that he had landed in her class. She wasn't sure of his story or his background, but there was just something about him that gave her some sense of accomplishment as a teacher as she put X's on his paper and would eventually write D or F. She did it with some sense of you're getting what you deserve. One of her responsibilities at the beginning of every year was to go through the child's file. And she had purposely put Teddy's at the bottom of the stack. And it was several weeks into the school year that she got to Teddy's file and she read these life-changing notes. His first grade teacher had written, Teddy's a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly. He does it on time. He's well-mannered. He's a joy to have around in class. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy's an excellent student, well-liked by his classmates, but he's troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and it must be tough at home. His third grade teacher wrote at the end of the year, his mother's death has been hard on Teddy. He tries to do his best. His father doesn't show much interest. His home life will soon affect its, uh, uh, affect its some, uh, uh, some, if some steps are not taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn, doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have any friends. And he sometimes sleeps in class. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized that the problem and uh, uh, what the problem was, and she was ashamed of herself. A few days after reading through this file and realizing who Teddy Stoddard was, it was almost Christmas break, and they were throwing this fifth grade Christmas party. And like all little fifth graders, they raced to the front of the class to give their teacher a gift. Many of them wrapped in wonderful, pretty 
paper and neat bows, but there sat Teddy's wrapped in a brown paper grocery store bag. Because that's all he had. That day, Mrs. Thompson decided to open Teddy's gift first as the kids murmured and they laughed. She opened the gift and out fell a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. The other kids began to giggle over, over Teddy's gifts, but Miss Thompson silenced them by immediately putting on the bracelet and splashing on some of the perfume on her wrist. Doesn't it smell lovely, she said. The end of the day, Teddy slowly came over to the desk and said, Mrs. Thompson, you smell like my mother and her bracelet looks really pretty on you too. I'm glad you liked my present. When Teddy left the classroom, Mrs. Thompson got down on her knees and she wept profusely and she asked God to forgive her for writing him off as a failure. She made a commitment to give her best to him. When the kids got back from Christmas break, Miss Thompson made an intentional investment in Teddy Stoddard. He got her best, her best energy, her best teaching, and Teddy began to excel. He had caught up with all the other students and was even ahead of some. He began to expand his relational network. This little boy who was on the bad track came to life, and fifth grade was life-changing for Teddy Stoddard, and it was all because Mrs. Thompson decided that she was going to love a young man who needed love mrs. Thompson didn't hear from Teddy for a long time then one day she received a note that read dear mrs. Thompson I wanted you to be first to know I will be graduating second in my class love Teddy Stoddard four years later another note came dear mrs. Thompson they just told me I would be graduating first in my class I want you to be the first to know the university has not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Teddy Stoddard. Four years later, this dear Mrs. Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know my dad has since passed away. I'm getting married next month, and I want to know if you'll sit where my mother would have sat if she was alive. Love, Teddy Stoddard. Mrs. Thompson went to that wedding and sat where Teddy's mother would have sat. She was wearing that bracelet and had sprayed herself with some hint of that perfume. And at the end of the ceremony, Mrs. Thompson and Teddy embraced. And Teddy whispered into Mrs. Thompson's ear, you were my favorite teacher. And the love that you gave me in fifth grade altered the course of my life. By the way, that's a true story. Love is the only strategy. I don't know how much time that you spend in this book called the Bible. But even a casual reader will find that at the top of the theme list of the Bible is this theme called love. No matter what story, no matter what passage, no matter what book or time period, there's always this hint of love. God's love for humanity. God's passion to see love as the only strategy in this thing called life. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second most, uh, most important is similar. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. God says these are the two things that matter most in life. Love for God and love for people. He says if you get these two things, you've got it. Love is the only strategy. Why? Why is it more important than anything else? If you're taking notes, number one, love validates my faith. Love validates my faith. Faith, what does that mean? It proves that I really am part of the family of God. It proves that I really am going to heaven. It proves that I'm saved, that I've been born again, that I'm part of the family of God, that I'm on the right side, not the wrong side. He says the proof of that is love it validates your faith if you were to go to the White House 
or if you were to go to the U.S. Mint or some other highly secure building, before they let you in, you have to authenticate or validate your identity. You have to prove you are who you say you are. They won't let you into the White House or the U.S. Mint you, with just, just walking in. You've got to take some documents and sometimes a thumbprint. There are all kinds of different things you have to do in order to validate that you are who you say you are before they let you in. That's true of a lot of things in life. You can't just walk up to an ATM and say, give me some money. You have to validate you that with your card. You have, to, uh, you have to bring it with you. You have to put in a PIN code, right? And in order for you to get into heaven, I want you to hear me. You have to validate your identity. You have to prove that you really are a child child of God, that you've really trusted Christ and you know him, that you have a relationship with God. How do you validate your identity? The Bible says that God looks at your lifestyle and he says, do you love? Do you love God with all of your heart and do you love your neighbor as yourself? The Bible says this, whoever does not love does not know God. Pretty clear. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. The reason God wants you to learn to love on earth is because he wants you to become just like him. 1 John chapter 4 verse 20 says, if we say we love God but we hate others, we're liars. That's pretty blunt. For we cannot love God whom we have not seen if we do not love others whom we have seen. Love validates my faith. It proves that I really am a child of God. Number two, why is it so important? Is because love integrates my life. In other words, it becomes the dominant life principle by which everything else in my life is integrated. My social life, my financial life, my church life, my work life, my sex life, my friend life. Every other part of my life becomes integrated by love. You need to have something at the core of your heart that draws your life together. Otherwise, your life is just fragmented. It's not whole. It's not one. Uh, it's not one. It's not together. Everybody in this place, write this down, has a dominant life principle. That means everybody in the, in the sound of my voice builds their life around something. Some people build their life around money, getting rich. Some people build their life around fame or becoming popular. Some people build their life around success. Some people build their life around sex. Some people build their life around some hobby. There's lots of things that you can make your dominant life principle. But what you need is something that is so strong at the center. It's not going to fall apart when the trials come, when tribulation and problems, when the road ends, uh, when the, immers and the emotional earthquakes take place and the financial hurricanes, when all the things in life hit you and batter you. You better have something at the center of your life, something that's going to hold together everything in your life so that nothing falls apart. And the Bible says the only thing that is strong enough is love. Love for God and love for other people. It becomes the center and it brings everything else into focus. It's what ties everything else together. It validates my faith. Why is love the only strategy? It integrates my life, but thirdly, it compensates for my sin. Now, this is really good news. It means when I blow it, when I make mistakes, when I sin, when I have faults and fumbles, that God says my first question is not, did he sin? The first question is, does he love me? Does he love my son, Jesus Christ? If he or she does, we're just going to cover over that sin. We're going to compensate for it. We know he or she is imperfect, but what matters most is, do they love me? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Whew. 
what does that mean? What does that mean? He covers a multitude of sins. Well, first it means when you love Jesus and, and he loves you, it covers up all your sins that you've ever done. When Jesus Christ came to earth and died on the cross, he stretched out his hands and he says, this is how much I love you. I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to take the punishment for all the laws, the moral laws that you've broken. I'll take your rap. I'll take the time. I'll pay the debt. Jesus says, because I love you, everything you've ever done and everything you will ever do that is wrong will be forgiven. Come on, church. That's good news. Bible says that the love of Jesus covers my sins but the other thing that it means when it says love covers a multitude of sins is that once I've been forgiven God gives me the power to let other people off the hook he gives me the power to let other people off I've been forgiven and now I can forgive others he gives me the ability to let people off the hook to cut them some slack You find somebody who is judgmental, they're self-righteous, always putting other people down, always negative. It means they don't feel love for themselves and they've never experienced the grace of God. Because when you understand how much you've been forgiven, you just start cutting a lot of other people some slack. You just start being gracious with other people. You don't get as angry as you used to. You don't get so upset when other people blow it because you know how much you've been forgiven and now you're able to cover the sins of others. Listen, when you really love somebody and they blow it, love doesn't rub it in. Love rubs it out. That's the mark of love. God says, I want you to experience my love so you can pass it on to other people. You can be gracious. You can be forgiving. You can be merciful and cut people some room when they blow it and they make mistake. Love covers. Listen, folks, the history of the world is that God uses imperfect people. He uses sinners to get the job done. He uses everybody who is imperfect, but who loves him. One of the greatest stories in the Bible is the story of King David. He was the king of Israel. David was not exactly a, a perfect guy. In fact, he blew it a lot. He lied, he cheated, he stole another guy's wife, he committed adultery, and then he had the guy murdered to cover up his sin. Not exactly a nice guy. But the one thing about David is when he blew it, he admitted it quickly and he would repent quickly. And he said, I'm sorry, God, I shouldn't have done that. I blew it, but I really love you. David, in the middle of all of his mess-ups, he loved God, and he said, I want to do what's right. I don't always do what's right, but I want to, and I love you, Lord. And God says this about David. That's a man after my own heart. And every time I read that, it is confusing and it is comforting. It is confusing because how in the world can God say that? That David is a man after his own heart. He is blowing it and making all kinds of mistakes. But it's comforting because he says, I'm going to cover over your sins because he loves me. Folks, listen to me. Get this if you don't get anything else this morning. You get this. More important than you being perfect is that you love God with all your heart. God does not expect you to be perfect. In fact, he knows you can't be perfect. You stopped being perfect a long, long time ago. So just forget that one. What matters is not that you you haven't screwed up in life or messed up in life. What matters is, do you love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself? God says, if you do that, It will cover a multitude of sins. It's the most important thing. It validates my faith. It shows I really am a follower of God, that I really do love him. It integrates my life because I treat everybody the same way. I love them all. 
it compensates for my sin. God says, yeah, he messes up a lot, but he really loves me, and he loves my son Jesus. But then there's a fourth thing, and I'm going to let you go. Number four, the reason why love is the only strategy, why it matters in our life, is love re reverberates forever. Love reverberates forever. What does that mean? It means it goes on and on and on and on. It echoes in eternity. It, it, in fact, it's the only thing in life that's going to last. Everything else you do is temporary, but every single loving action is going on in eternity, and God's going to reward it in eternity. Watch what the Bible says. These three things continue forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. I had a great man in my church years ago. His name was Charles Birdwell. He meant a lot to me as a young pastor. He was my friend. Pastors don't have a lot of friends. I'm talking people who are there for you no matter what. Charles was my friend. He was diagnosed with cancer for the second time. And he came up to me and he said, PR, my cancer has returned, and the doctors told me that I only have six weeks to live. I said, well, Charles, we're going to really pray for you. And he said, no, I don't want you to pray for me. He said, I'm going to pray for you and for everyone in this church. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm going to pray that you won't be distracted by life because I'm not distracted anymore. I see things clearly. My relationship with my wife is sweeter than it's ever been. My relationship with God is stronger than it's ever been. I'm in such peace. I'm doing all the things that are so important because I see it clearly now. And I'm praying for all of you that you won't be distracted by life and you will see it clearly. Charles lost his long fight with cancer and he went to be with the Lord. And at his memorial service, it was all about love because love was his dominant life value. It was all about the love of God, and he told me, he said, PR, before I came to Victory, our church was called Victory Assembly, it was all about judgment for me. I grew up in a church that was all about judgment. When I got here, I felt the love and the grace of God for the first time, and it changed my life completely. He never dreamed that he would have such an impact. Some people set out to do something great with their life, and Charles just lived life to love people. Every woman loves the movie The Notebook. Most women have seen it five, six, ten times. Now, I've seen The Notebook once, and it was good. It was a great movie once. Now, Gladiator, Braveheart, that's a movie you can see five, six, ten times. <laughs> but The Notebook, that's a good movie one time. Now, women love The Notebook, and here's the reason why. In the book and in the movie... There's an elderly man in a nursing home, and his character is played by James Garner. And he's in the nursing home with his wife, who has Alzheimer's disease, and she doesn't even recognize him. But he says this at the beginning of the movie. I'm nothing special. Just a common man with common thoughts, and I've led a common life. There are no monuments dedicated to me, and my name will soon be forgotten. But in one respect, I have succeeded as gloriously as everyone, anyone who has ever lived. I have loved another, I have loved another with all of my heart and soul, and to me, this has always been enough. How about you? Has love always been enough? Or is it about success? Is it more achievements? Is it more possessions? Is it more pats on the back? 
Or is it about love? I want everybody to look at me this morning. Because at the end of your life, you'll realize that love is the only dominant life value that matters. If you want a legacy to last, if you want people to remember you, love. Love lasts. In fact, nothing else does. I hate to tell you this, but people are going to forget your work. People are never remembered for what they, were, what they made. They're remembered for what they gave away. They're, they're remembered for their love. And I even hate to tell you this, but the truth is one day your trophies are going to be trashed. That bowling trophy, that merit badge, that certificate of accomplishment, that gold watch that you got for retirement. N not, nobody's going to remember those things. It doesn't really matter because none of those things are going to last. The only thing that's going to last is what you did in love. Nothing else you do on this planet is permanent. It's all temporary. All the trophies are going to be trashed one day. Listen, as a pastor of over 35 plus years, I've been with a lot of people like Charles as they've taken their dying breath, whether it was at a hospital or it was in their home. And I've stood at the bedside of many people who went from life to eternity. And I have to tell you folks, listen to me, I, I, uh, 35 plus years I've never had anybody look at me as they're taking their dying breath. Pastor, I'm ready to die. Please bring me my certificate award. I want to look at it one more time. Bring me my diploma. Bring me my watch. Bring me my trophy. Nobody asks for those things. People are dying. They don't want things around them. What they want is people. They want the people that they love, and they want to love those people. The truth is, everybody, every one of us will eventually learn the basic truth of life. That life is about relationships, not accomplishments. What matters is do I love God with all my heart and do I love everybody else? Because that's why God put me on this earth. In fact, the Bible says life without love is worthless. It's a wasted life. It says no matter what I say or what I believe or what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Why am I spending so much time on this? Because people have given first class allegiance to second class causes. And those causes have betrayed you. You get busy and here's what happens. When you get overloaded and you get in a hurry and you start doing what I call relational skimming. You start skimming off the top. You say, I don't have time. I don't have time for church. I don't have time to be alone with God. I don't have time for friends. I don't have time for my family. I don't have time for relationships. Listen, nothing can take the place of love. And one day you're going to stand before God in heaven after this trial run on earth is over. And he's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? And one of the things he's going to say to you is, listen, tell me what you did on earth. He's not going to say, tell me about your career. I'm fascinated about that. Tell me about how many jobs you had or how many sales you made or how many deals you closed. God's not going to ask you how did you get how how big did your bank account get how much did you invest and where did you invest it he's not going to ask show me your credit report
He's not going to say, tell me about your handicap. Tell me how well you did in sports. Hear me. When you stand before God, he's going to say this. Did you do what I put you on earth to do? Did you learn to love me with all of your heart and my son Jesus who I sent? Did you learn to love everybody else? That's why I put you there. Tell me about your relationships. And a lot of times we know that relationships are a good thing, but we act like there's something we kind of have to make time for. Like I really need to make time in my schedule for some relationship. Like it's one more thing I need to add to my life. No, folks, it is life. All the other stuff is peripheral. Your relationships are your life. Your job and everything else is peripheral. God didn't put you on this earth for a job. He put you on this earth to learn to love. And when we say, I need to squeeze relationships into my schedule, I need to fit it in as it's, a, it's, as it's just one of, of, of many things in my life, you are missing the point. Life is not about achievement. It's about love. Busyness causes us to forget that. Love is the only strategy. Did the Beatles get it right? Yeah, they did. And as I pray for you today, as we go from where we are today and we go about our week, I pray that the preoccupation of your mind and your thoughts would not be about performance or success or, or your weaknesses, but you be preoccupied with God's extraordinary, extensive, and expansive love for you. His love never fails. It never quits. For as long as God exists, his love for you remains. What an extraordinary love. was singing this this morning how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Can we sing that one more time? How marvelous, how wonderful, and my Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Jesus, I pray this morning that we'll be overwhelmed. We don't have the words to express the gratitude and appreciation for your love. Your love changes everything. And I pray today that you would transform and change our lives by your love. I pray that you would help us to respond and to accept and to acknowledge and revel in your love toward us. And I thank you for that. As we continue to pray, there's some of you that as we talk about love, there's something that's pulling you in the direction of God. You may not be able to fully understand it, but there's something drawing you this morning toward him. And let me just tell you what that is. It's his love. Using the power of the Holy Spirit to draw you. You're not here by accident. Deep down, you know it. 
You may look at your life and you think, I would love to know his goodness. I would love to give my life to him, but yet there's so many things that I've got to fix in my life. I want you to hear me clearly. You cannot fix yourself. Our sin separates us from a holy God, and that's why the gospel is good news, because Jesus was without sin, perfect in every way, died on the cross, rose again so that anyone, and that includes you, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There are those of you, this is your moment right now. Get ready to let you go. This is your moment. You sense it. Your moment to call on him and say, yes, I need your grace. I need his mercy. Today I turn from my sin and I turn toward him. Jesus, take my life. I give it to you. If that's your prayer right now, 10 seconds right now, I want you to lift up and catch my eye. Raise a hand and catch my eye. Say, Pastor, pray for me this morning. God bless you. God bless you. How many more? Pastor, pray for me this morning. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, in the back. Yes, ma'am. Another one right there. Yes, sir. I see you in the back hit there. How many more? Pastor, pray for me. Five seconds. Five seconds. I'm moving on. Yes. To my left. Jesus, take my life. Jesus, I surrender to you. Anybody else? I want everybody in this house to pray this prayer. Nobody by themselves. I want you to pray it with passion. For the Bible says if you pray it and believe it in your heart, you will be saved. So this is not some flimsy prayer we pray. We pray it with power because it's a powerful prayer. And he'll do exactly what he says he will do. Will you say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. Jesus, take my life. It is not my own. Today I give it to you. Thank you for new life. Jesus, you have mine. In your name I pray. Amen. Everybody look up. And PCA, would you really worship big right now? Will you worship big right now? Welcome these people into the family of God. Wow. It never gets old around this place. And as it continues to grow and get bigger, some of y'all are are messing with me. I'm used to you being in one spot. You're moving and it's messing me up. I'm just telling you, Mike, you messed me up. You're supposed to be over here, Mike. Cal, you're supposed to be over here. Can't do that to me. Thank you for being with us this morning. I live for this moment. Don't miss this series. It'll blow your mind. Next, I'm already, I was sharing with some of the staff folks, I'm already getting requests. Somebody said, are you going to do Queen? Uh, what is a love, a love song that they do? Somebody said, are you going to do Love Shack from the B-52s? <laughs> Next Sunday, Rod Stewart, have I told you lately that I love you? If I had a thousand dollars to bet and somebody said would you bet who wrote that song I would have said Rod Stewart wrote that song he did not I'll share that with you next week and we're going to talk about have I told you lately that I love you we're going to talk about our words if you're married you don't want to miss next Sunday you're in a relationship you don't want to miss it it's going to be a big one it's going to be a biggie. So I hope you'll come. Keep the request coming in. I've only got four weeks, folks, so I can't do all the songs. What I'm noticing is all you all in this place, you're real spiritual, but when it comes to songs, 
you get a little crazy. Yeah, you come in here and you know, but you got, you, there's some of y'all, you love your 80s and your 70s music and all that. You come over, Pastor, can we do that song? I only got four weeks. It's going to be a great series, and I hope you'll come and enjoy it. Love is all that matters, folks. Walk out of this place with that in your heart. First lady's there in the back. She'll be there shaking your hand as you leave. And listen, folks, lots of opportunities. Be with us Wednesday, Building University. Be back next week. You're going to have a great time together. Thank you for being with us. Online folks as well. Shake hands, be friendly, love one another with the love of the Lord. We'll see you back here next week. God bless you.